homework five is due today. Please turn it in. And the uh, term project proposals are due tomorrow at midnight or so. I'm not going to be strict on that, but definitely have them done before spring break because I'm going to grade them over spring break. So, <clears throat> I'm going to finish up last time's talk on cyber warfare by going over basically the policy hurdles that the West faces, specifically this country, the United States. Um, this portion of the talk is largely taken from Professor Michael Knox's 2011 work called The Cybersecurity Challenge. I had the pleasure of meeting him and listening to a number of his presentations when I was at the Sandia Summer Institute this summer. And uh, he was introduced to the group as a living national treasurer. And after looking into his history, I can definitely see why, because he has been instrumental uh, in shaping US policy all throughout the Cold War and has so many insights into the inner workings of government, the executive branch, foreign policy, and how everything really comes together. And so his insights on cybersecurity policy and how they parallel to basically nuclear deterrence in the Cold War are really, really worth looking into. So that's what we'll be going over for this section. So we face eight hurdles. The number one hurdle, he declares, is basically we lack a solid declaratory policy. By that, I mean war declaration policy. We, do, we have said we reserve the right to use military force in response to cyber attacks, but there's no real line drawn in the sand. It's left intentionally vague. And the problem with specifying if you cause X amount of damage, an attacker will always just do X minus one amount of damage as, as long as possible you know, to asymptotically basically approach that line in the sand. So. Because of that challenge, and no other things, it really it, it, it hurts us more than not to not have actually a line in the sand drawn, because we don't have a plan for how we should coordinate uh, in the event of a major cyber attack against perhaps our military forces, or instead perhaps our command and control systems, or perhaps instead our electrical grid, financial networks. There's no unified plan as to what we should do. What what initiatives should be basically uh, started in the event of some major attack. Secondly, there's no real deterrence policy. In the nuclear, basically, Cold War, it was a game of mutually assured destruction. If you attack us, we're going to wipe you out, and everyone's going to die. Um, in cyberspace, it's you can see some parallels, because uh, say I have basically super sucks net. If I attack you, it's going to be out in the wild and somebody can copy and paste it and use it against everyone else. So, so it requires some finesse in using these weapons because they're not like an atomic bomb. They're not like an atomic cruise missile. Once you use them, they're out there and they can be reused. So it's a whole different game, but there's some sort of similar deterring parallels. But at the same time, there's no attribution. At the same in, at the same level that there was in the Cold War, if an ICBM were launched, you can de you can detect it from space and from radar systems. You can detect what part of the world is being launched from. Cyber attacks. There's proxies. There's Tor. There's everything. There's anonymous VPN. Uh, and then you know, people could be on your own home turf and they're from another country and they're attacking you. The attribution here is very difficult. So therefore. That also compounds the, the deterrence problem and hurdle. And even when de attacks are detected, and perhaps even if there is uh, attribution, some level of attribution, um, the damage that was done may not actually reveal itself till later. Maybe they inserted a logic bomb that will basically detonate half a decade or a decade later. So. There's actually, there's the third hurdle is basically there's no well-established policies on who, who are to be the authorities and what their responsibilities are in the event of basically cyber attacks. Um, if we responded in with military force, if one country responded with military force 
to another country's cyber attacks that would indubitably involve some violation of that nation's sovereignty. So that throws into the mix all sorts of legal concerns. You have to establish basically legal basis to conduct such operations to not basically be seen as a bad guy in the world court. And so there's no real legal basis for establishing uh, in the initialization of military con uh, conflict as a result of some sort of cyber conflict. That cyber to kinetic tie isn't really there. The cyber and kinetic have been used, uh, attacks have been used in conjunction at the same time, but that's after kinetic attacks have already started, such as in the Russia Georgia war, when G Russia decided to just go ahead and invade its neighbor because it wanted some land, they just used kinetic uh, cyber attacks to supplement their strategies. And it's worth noting that establishing this basics for traditional kinetic attack, you know, traditional military force uh, attacks basically takes weeks to months. And in cyberspace, we all know that things happen in microseconds, milliseconds, seconds. So there's this huge time lag that has to be gapped as well in order to establish effective policies. You can't have policies where we're going to go, after we suffered some major cyber attack, go to our congressional committee and find out what we should do. That's going to take weeks. So you have to not only defeat all these legal hurdles for tying together the cyber and kinetic legal problems, you have to also establish policies that are going to be effective and not uh, suffer from massive amount of lag of bureaucracy. The fourth and perhaps what I consider one of the most important ones, um, you have to have policies that guarantee civil liberties. Um, as we've seen with the uh, SOPA and PIPA bills, as well as CISPA, they in some instances do nothing to solve the problem they declare that they intend to solve and are easily circumventable. And on top of that, they create exponentially more civil liberty problems. They, they absolutely, in SOPA and PIPA, they absolutely did no possible good being proposed. Um, CISPA uh, does nothing to protect civil liberties. There's no, there's no responsibility to notify a citizen if their data is mishandled under following, under compliance with the CISPA Act. The CISPA Act is the Cyber Intelligence Sharing uh, what is it called? Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act. Uh, it circumvents all of these uh, privacy acts. And these acts expressly declare that you are allowed to initiate lawsuits against a company that goes too far in divulging your private information. However, CISPA allows them to resell and share data with anyone for cybersecurity and other purposes. So <laughs> this does nothing to address basically civil liberties. It actually does everything to trample on them in some regards, although perhaps the original uh, authors of these bills didn't mean for it to go this way. If you don't take care to address civil liberty concerns and to guarantee that ex established civil liberties will be maintained, you are going to basically be exacerbating the whole cybersecurity problem. <clears throat> so which brings me to the next and related point is that you have to have some sort of effective oversight that uh, ensures that basically civil liberties are being guaranteed, that all these like, other policies are working, and also doesn't bureaucratically lag down the whole process. You can't have an oversight committee that slows down everything by weeks or days. So, and then you have to, there has to be consideration as to establish some entity to be in the role for oversight, perhaps Congress. And we've all seen how few congressmen really even understand the internet, unfortunately. So, <sighs> since we're just finished talking about basically sharing information and how to establish policies that do it in a manner that guarantees civil, civil liberties, um, the reason for sharing information is to increase situational awareness. If you're completely unaware of your situation, you're completely unable to defend yourself. 
if you don't know you're being attacked, you can't really do anything to stop being attacked uh, unless you just get lucky. Um, and we all know that you can't just rely on being lucky in this field. So there's a great need to actually share such information, such cybersecurity information, not just at a domestic level between companies and between government and private uh, uh, industry, but between governments and between countries at an international scale. Um, so the U.S. already shares select information and intelligence on you know, uh, various different things with its key allies, um, but should it, should it broaden the audience for sharing information on cybersecurity? Perhaps there's a botnet going around this, utilizing some ODA and just spamming everything and taking down stuff. And perhaps in some instances, stealing intellectual property. Um, what could it gain from broadening the audience of uh, information sharing at government levels? Perhaps a lot. Um, however, when, when you give something, you should always expect something back. So if we broaden the audience, what should we expect to gain from uh, said co uh, cooperation. So perhaps there could be formal treaties established in this area is uh, one way to address this challenge. But that may be too constraining and may end up being a bad idea as treaties often when implemented uh, end up going wrong and getting, once they're ratified, get misconstrued in law and everything gets twisted and goes wrong. So. It's an interesting hurdle in itself. And so speaking of basically deterrence, um, since you're, uh, since basically the internet is worldwide, and we do need to share this information basically with a more global audience to basically raise situational awareness, um, is that we also have to have some sort of basically collective effort for deterrence. Um, now this is a basically a messy area because some would argue the best way to do this is to basically have universal cybersecurity laws, like universal intellectual property laws that span the whole world and this and that and this and that. I, I don't know how realistic that is. So um, yeah. And lastly, as we talked about, um, last time. Another policy hurdle is basically you have to strengthen the cooperation between <coughs> private sector and government cooperation. And uh, I think a recent one was trying to do that. I think it was called the Cybersecurity Act. I covered that last time. It was trying to do that. It was, it was compared to the rest, it was well written because it made express uh, uh, requirements that citizen data is not shared with the intelligence community, is not shared with the NSA, and not shared with this and that. It's not shared with the military. Um, because this act is only for raising cybersecurity awareness for critical infrastructure. So basically, like DHS and FBI will collaborate with critical infrastructure companies. So your power grid, your air traffic control, your sanitization for water, and uh, traffic control will all collaborate, they'll all monitor basically info. And now clearly, you know, we're not sharing uh, our social security numbers and stuff like that with all of these companies. So, and we're not, you know, usually visiting them on a regular basis. So it leads less to uh, them being able to track your day-to-day -day movements because you probably pay these bills once a month. So it's not as intrusive as uh, CISPA perhaps. Um, and it also makes express guarantees to prohibit uh, basically, to establish least privilege in the bill itself for who needs to access to this information, not just you can share it with anyone for cybersecurity or other purposes. Obviously, that's the worst wording you could use. <clears throat> so um, he wraps up his uh, his wonderful article by saying that we are still in the infancy of understanding cybersecurity. I completely agree. Um, he says it's also analogous to the late 1940s and the nuclear age. Um, we hardly understood understood the rules and the game back then, and hopefully it will not take us more than a decade this time as well. So, in the future, we're probably going to expect seeing much more 
uh, state-sponsored cyber attacks and malware, and then those being repurposed by criminals. Um, more research in honeypots and counterintelligence systems that basically lure in attackers and then waste their time. Um, this is my research area. Um, and then also there's a lot of push towards uh, globally adopting IPv6 and what this possibly means for attribution. And there's a lot of myths about that, but um, it does help to an extent. So it's all really pretty crazy. Um, so the main needs of the security world at this stage are we need better situational awareness. And a lot of people argue that the way to do this is to improve big data analytics. Because if you've ever sat on the side of a system administrator, you can't watch the logs in real time. There's tools to basically help you analyze those, those logs and all the events going in real time for a network. And so those tools are pretty helpful, but they're not that great. So there needs to be better tools for analyzing all the huge amounts of data that's going on in a network in order to be, be able to basically be more situationally aware at the given moment. Um, and you can, ease, you can easily understand how that problem has worsened the larger and larger network gets. Um, so there's also a, uh, a big strive for having more threat intelligence. There's a lot of companies actually uh, sell consulting uh, for uh, threat intelligence. Hundreds, if not thousands, of exploits come out and vulnerabilities come out every year, but really only like a dozen or two dozen are actually commonly used by the majority of attackers um, for, for mainly their reliability, ease of use, and for what they provide. Some vulnerabilities only allow denial of service. Some other vulnerabilities allow remote code execution and privilege escalation. Some <laughs> They're not all the same. So um, instead of worrying and saying, oh my god, everything's so insecure, basically these consulting companies go and say, no, look, you just have to really pay attention to these main ones, secure against these ones, and you mitigate 90% of all your risk. Then you can go about you know, resuming normal code auditing, uh, penetration testing, and security assessment, um, and be pretty, pretty well off. Um, Another big need of basically the security world is that there needs to be more harmony on cyber law, um, a lot of people argue. Um, I don't know how well universal intelligence IP right laws are going to work. Um, and uh, people need to be more aware, especially policymakers, need to be more aware of uh, how the Internet of Things is really going to impact the future. Um, so if you want to read that paper, it's probably like two, three pages. It's a quick read. It's very good. He cogently explains the problem. I have a link to it here so you can go read it. Any questions on that? I'm going to move on to the next lecture. Oh, yep, nope. Okay, no. All right. It's going to be a short lecture today. So we're going to talk about social engineering and perhaps how you can use this to have more fun next week if you're not stuck doing work all the time. So social engineering is essentially any act where you try to manipulate another person to accomplish a goal. That goal may or may not be in that person's interest. Um, so in the realm of security, the common goal for an attacker using social information, social engineering is to get the victim or his target to disclose information to him. Um, it often is leveraged, it is often used leveraging uh, already known reconnaissance information from basically open source intelligence gathering. So reconnaissance is basically the first little stage in the pen tester and hacker life, life cycle. It's essentially exploration and probing to discover vital information about your target and their resources and the layout of the terrain, basically the network. And so social engineering can be used in actually any aspect of this chain. So a very interesting use of it in post-exploitation, I'm sure a lot of you guys have been getting emails from FSU Help Desk saying, hey, go to this Google document and give us your FSU ID number 
your password and your other stuff. Um, I got, I should have put it in, in the next slides. I got a well-crafted email from FSU Help Desk. All the headers checked down and everything, and it pointed me to a Google document. And the Google document was a form, and it just logged everything. And so I, I traced it down, and I opened up in my, my, basically my malware analysis VM to be safe. And I went in, and uh, basically, they are just logging all of it to a spreadsheet that's hidden in the background. It's pretty hilarious. So, um, there's a lot of instances where once, other than that, where once attackers gain, say, access to someone who has a lot of authority in their networks, like email, that they'll send an email to some other people saying, hey, I need this. Or could you tell me about this? I forgot. And because it's sent with an account that has authority and there's a sufficient amount of social engineering finesse and skill used in that phishing, spear phishing email, they often uh, succeed with a pretty high rate. So that leads to basically more com compromising more of a network and more of systems and information. So in terms of basically intelligence gathering, um, there's three really main ones that pertain to penetration testing. Um, there's op open source intelligence, there's signals intelligence, and there's human intelligence gathering. So OSINT is essentially your standard Google search, uh, searching perhaps even uh, the company's website, searching social media like LinkedIn, um, searching public records, especially financial records, um, searching DNS records, and then you basically know what the web servers are and what other IPs are registered to that uh, DNS record. Um, and so social media is interesting. You can find a lot just by looking at Facebook pages for employees of a company, looking at LinkedIn pages, and perhaps if you want to get dirty, you could go on online dating websites and probably find some people there too. Um, but uh, what people do with this sort of intelligence gathering is that they basically use uh, maybe Python or Perl script, and they find everyone working for this company, and they scrape every single word off these pages. And they put each word in the, on a line, it's online, in a dictionary file, and they use this to supplement any uh, brute forcing that they need to do to have, perhaps guess passwords. And it actually works with really high effect. People will list their, their likes and interests on their Facebook page. Like, I love this band, and I love cats, and I love everything else, and all this other stuff. And so basically, you take these, these, these seed uh, things that they like, and you permute them however you want, turn into lead speak and everything else. Um, and you have actually a high chance of guessing someone's password with this dictionary file that you've just gotten off of their social media page. And so that is something that pen testers actually actively use uh, nowadays. So internet archive searches are very important. You can see perhaps an old version of a website, and it may reveal some backend data that wasn't pro uh, properly protected, like the, the, the IP, or perhaps the name of the database behind it. Um, or perhaps some other information that was changed at the time. Um, and it's also something that's really uh, uh, important to look into is partners of your target company and uh, uh, any news of the target company perhaps merging with someone. Because I've seen a number of uh, successful social engineering competitions, capture the flag games, where someone would call them, call the target company and say, hey, I'm Bob from Company B, we're merging in a month. I want to make sure you know we're we're on the same page as our security policy, so we hit the ground running. <laughs> it's a pretty effective way to gain to disclose a lot of information they shouldn't disclose. Um, another thing that's uh, commonly done that I'm pretty sad about that's actually also being done here is often the management and the security of critical information, specifically sensitive information is often outsourced to companies that sell these services. Um, if you've noticed and got the email registration for next semester, for summer and fall, has been outsourced to some company in, Ho in Ohio, and they have your social security number and all these other things, and they didn't ask you first before sharing it. So in order to get this information, now you not just need, you're not just limited to one target, you can get it in two places. Um, but that's more interesting for bad guys. Obviously, pen testers 
are restricted by ethics and laws and hunting for social security numbers is not usually the specific uh, goal of a penetration test. So signals intelligence or SIGINT really uh, delves into the realm of Wi-Fi scanning, looking for access points that accompany um, to hack into their Wi-Fi and get behind their firewall. Um, it also falls into the realm of SMS eavesdropping. There's no security in SMS and you can eavesdrop on uh, text messages. Um, if you go to DEF CON, they have a wall of shame where they have a projector on, like a 20-foot wall of just really interesting text messages that they're seeing fly across the wire in a casino. And you'll find some like really horrible ones, like, oh man, I got so drunk last night, I woke up with this girl, I, I don't know what happened. And it's just like, oh man, that's pretty embarrassing. Um, and that's just being posted there. And then also there's a lot of uh, tools you can find um, and put together yourself to track other people's phones if you just know their phone number and their IP address. Um, you can GPS track their phone. Like phones, smartphones are like the greatest things for bad guys. They're so good, so good. Um, and then human intelligence, this is basically the realm of this talk on social engineering. So intelligence gathering, really, uh, the, there's, there's different types of intelligence you can gather. You can gather direct observations. Um, say I can stoop over your shoulder and see that, hey, you're running Windows 8 and IE 10. I can see that just by directly seeing it. There's indirect observations, like I can say, hey, are you running a version of Windows, uh, does, your, does your Internet Explorer have tabs? If you say yes, that tells me it's either version 9 or 10. This is an indirect observation I can make. And then inferential observations are pretty self-explanatory. Um, so let's talk about social engineering and exploiting the human mind. Because there's vulnerabilities in the human mind that you may or may not be aware of that we basically evolved with. Um, and even though we've grown to be sophisticated like this, we still have vulnerabilities from these days from essentially code reuse in the evolutionary process. So our brains are actually not optimized for modern society. As you can see in this population graph, basically it wasn't until 1800 that there was roughly a billion people on this planet. And so for the, the millions of years before that, the man was on this planet, basically man existed in essentially small tribal groups. So the brain essentially evolved to be optimized for small tribal groups that were mainly endemic to the African plains. And that maybe they would meet four to five strangers in their entire life. They would probably know 40 to 50 people throughout most of their entire life. <laughs> they'd live with them, they'd hunt with them, they'd eat with them. It was small, it was tight-knit. This is times back then. So there's a number of things that the mind evolved to do. And this brings me to basically biology. And that these trust relationships that were evolved in the mind also evolved uh, in many aspects in biology. Um, you'll see symbiotic relationships where uh, basically one fish guards another and the other fish cleans it. And for instance, with the case of the grouper and his cleaner fish, um, the problem that faces the cleaner fish is that the grouper eats fish, especially fish its size. So how does the cleaner fish uh, tell the grouper or make the grouper not eat it? Well, what happened, um, and I'm sure biologists can tell you more, is that essentially there evolved some sort of trust relationship. And how the cleaner fish does this is through something called the quiescence dance. It swims in front of the grouper and does this like little dance. The grouper is then rendered into a slack jaw state. It just sits there passively, almost goes unconscious. It's just some sort of trigger that happens in, his mind, in the grouper's mind once this quiescent stance is done in front of the grouper. The cleaner fish then goes inside the mouth of the grouper, cleans out, gets its fill on bacteria and food and grime, and then leaves. Basically, the grouper fish wakes up sometime later and then proceeds and has no memory of what just happened. None. 
So this trust relationship basically evolved through natural evolution and it's basically an instinctual behavior that's shared on both sides. And so these sort of trust relationships are actually have been uh, exploited through mimicry behavior from a number of different animals. Um, there's, there's a number of different mimicries, Batesian mimicry, Mullerian mimicry, and aggressive mimicry, which we're going to talk about. Uh, Batesian mimicry is essentially um, a prey, say a fish, learns the, the, the scare off tactics and behavior that a predator uses to scare off bigger predators. He then uses those to scare off predators with some degree of success. Mullerian mimicry is basically groups of poisonous prey collaborating together, um, distinct species. They, they learn because they have a common predator between the two species, or two or three or so many. They observe that essentially the predator uh, strays away from one, uh, from, from so, say we have poisonous species A is poisonous species B, and Charlie's the predator. B observes that Charlie basically backs off from prey A after prey A uh, exhibits some behavior, some essentially scare off behavior. Prey B then mimics this behavior to some degree of success at uh, scaring off the predator. So aggressive mimicry is essentially uh, not for the purpose of scaring off the predator, it's for the purpose of defeating the predator and eating the predator. Now in the case of the saber-toothed blenny, which is the fish on the right, the saber-toothed blenny learned the quiescence dance. It is also a fish about the size of the cleaner fish. It's a pretty fish. It's on the top right. That's a dead one on the bottom uh, right. It's about as long as your hand to your thumb, and entirely half of it is a jaw bone. What it does is it floats and swims in front of the grouper fish, does the quiescence dance, the grouper just slumps into a slack jaw state, and the saber tooth blending goes in and just eats the inside of the mouth. Gets its fill, can't eat the whole grouper inside out, and then swims out. The grouper wakes up and has no idea what just happened, but just it's just hurts like it's uh, hung over, but from the mouth. So saber tooth blenny have actually evolved over the years to basically follow around uh, basically a herd of grouper and exploit them. They don't eat enough in any one instance to do a significant amount of damage to cause it to die. They basically farm what they need at the time, but just enough to keep it alive. Very parasitic and very interesting. And it's very interesting because it exploits that evolutionary trigger in the grouper's mind. So let's delve into exploiting evolutionary triggers in the human mind. Most, I'm going to start with a Harvard uh, study that was done in the 70s on compliance. Compliance, or the study of compliance, is basically revolved on what is the absolute minimum we need to do or say in order to get someone to do us a favor. So the test in this study was basically, it was in the Harvard Library, and they have grad students doing the test, and they would approach people in the library who are already using a copier machine. And they would, their, their goal was to basically get them to stop and let them use the copier machine instead, to basically interrupt them. And so the goal is to find what is the minimum needed to say in order to get them to comply with the request to, hey, can I make copies? So the control group is basic, the control group is, hey, hi, I have five pages. Can I use the copy? That's it. No reasons given. And so they would experiment here with basically, can I use the copier because of X? Then can I use the copier because of Y? And so on. So the control group, I have five pages, can I use a copier, had 64% compliance. No reason given. So hundreds of students interrupted and asked if they could use the copier instead. And 64% of them said sure. Um, it must not have been during finals week or midterms week, so I don't know. 
So trial one was, hi, I have five pages. Can I use a copier because I am in a hurry? This had 94% compliance. And that's a pretty good reason. Everyone can be basically sympathetic of that. You know, you're in a rush and you get somewhere. You've all been there. So 94% of people would comply with this. So they basically have a super high success rate and it's a pretty good reason and then no reason given. So then they have this range that they want to experiment with. And specifically what they're trying to experiment with is can we vary the lameness of our reason and explore how that affects the compliance rate range? So they explored with more and more increasingly lame reasons, less compelling reasons, and the results still yielded relatively high compliance. And eventually they came down to their final trial in which they decided we need to stop and look at what's going on here. This is something amazing. Because the t trial was, hi, I have five pages. Can I use the copier because I need to make copies? Clearly, that is logically equivalent to, hi, I have five pages. Can I use the copier? It's completely specious reasoning. And it got 93% compliance. 1% less than... I need to use it because I'm in a hurry. And so this, this was baffling. We're at Harvard. Clearly these people aren't idiots. What is going on? At the end of the study, they effectively discovered that the magic word here is because. The word because exploits this evolutionary trigger in our brain. Our brain is optimized for small tribal life. And it's just like the saber tooth bunny. Whatever follows doesn't really matter. The simple existence of the word because just statistically increases the chance of you complying with that request. Now this is obviously is not going to work every time because we're talking about statistics. So <clears throat> in small tribal life there would be few liars and if they were found out they'd often get exiled or shamed in some way. And so given that basically we've only had 2,000 years since, since basically uh, civilization is being established and everything has changed. We still have millions of years of this code reuse from the evolutionary process in our DNA. And so there have been other studies to find out quirks of the human brain other than the magic word because. Um, so these six quirks that I'm going to talk about are relevant to social engineering because they can help you disclose info, they can help you get a job, and they can help you get a raise. And I'm going for a job interview tomorrow, so I'm going to probably be using this. So, the first one is reciprocity. We tend to return favors regardless of the original favor. Even if we didn't want the original favor, our brain is rather flattered by the fact that someone tried to do us a favor. So, this is exploited commonly by charities. Before they ask you for donating money, they usually hand you flowers or drink maybe bourbon, your favorite scotch or something, or hand you snacks or a souvenir, then they ask for a donation. It exploits the temptation to give back. Now, this unfortunately doesn't work with Nigerian scammers. I, I, I just don't know why. But this also works in negotiation. So, when, when negotiating, if you make a concession and then ask for one in return, you're more likely to have the person you're negotiating with comply with you, regardless of what that concession was. You're being seen as basically taking a step forward to make the process work, to make an agreement, and you're giving something up. Um, so this is commonly exploited in bartering. You see, all see Palm Stars and all the ridiculous shows on TV that take over what should be some history or discovery or learning show. Instead, we're seeing people argue about price. So. In every instance of these people arguing about price, always the guy who's the shark offers an outrageously high price first, or an outrageously low price first. So if they're buying, they would offer the, the low price. If they're selling, they offer the really high price. And then the other person who's basically offended is like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm going to give you, I, the most I can do is, or the least I can do is that. And so when they make that first concession down to what they're actually really willing to at to the top range of what they're willing to sell this for or at the bottom range of what they're willing to buy this for. The brain is tricked into thinking essentially, okay, 
there's some progress here. We're getting closer to an agreement. Just by the very act of that one concession, people leave the negotiation, the bartering, feeling happier. There have been studies where basically people are allowed to negotiate price and they're getting ripped off in the same way. And then there's studies where people have to pay a flat price and still getting ripped off. But in the first trial where there's a negotiation, they make it so that it never drops below the second trial's price. So you're actually still paying more in the instance where you're able to negotiate. And then they ask the people after each, how happy do you feel? Everyone felt happier in case one. Really interesting. So reciprocity can be exploited for initiating tricky conversations, um, especially when asking for a raise, which is a tricky subject. Um, if you're seen as basically having done something for someone else, perhaps done a favor for someone else, hey, I fixed that printer for you, is this a good time to talk about my performance evaluation? It actually eases the initiation of tricky conversations. And so this can be actually used to get uh, information disclosed, perhaps about a target network, and so on. Or perhaps a boss's schedule, and you can see. You, I'll let you guys imagine. So the next trick is essentially uh, consistency. The human mind tries to be consistent with its prior actions, even if the reasons for the original actions have changed. So charities really uh, have successfully exploited this. I think the American Cancer Society uh, there was a paper, I heard a story about American Cancer Society. What they do, they get a list of people that are going to call and ask for donations. Before they call them and ask them for donations, they'd call them and they'd not identify themselves as a cancer society. They'd say, hey, we're, we're Center for American Charity. And we just want to ask you two questions. Would you be willing to donate a small amount of your time for a charity that you liked if you were asked to. Most of the people said yes to this. And they asked them some other irrelevant question to throw the trail off. Two, three weeks later, the ACS would call and say, hey, we're the American Cancer Society. We fund cancer research. We're for curing cancer in children and all sorts of people. Would you like to donate money to us? And if you do donate money, could you spend a little bit of time calling other people you know for us? And they actually get a much higher compliance rate with that prior phone call than they do just by cold calling these people with this question. Because the human mind is tricked into being consistent with its previous decisions. So salesmen exploit this. And I've fallen for this myself. I've disclosed a retarded amount of information myself especially when they, when they visit me and it's too early in the morning for my brain to start working. They, they basically, they, when they are talking to you, they get you to start filling out paperwork. Before asking you to commit, they're still telling you the details. Let me just get this paperwork started with you. And so you start filling it out, you probably leave some things blank, right? Because you don't want to give your social security number over right away because you don't know what they're selling just yet. And so it's really surprising how much information you can get. You usually can get someone's social security number um, before you tell them what you're selling. And so after they start filling out this information, the brain has unconsciously made a small commitment. And so studies have shown that by using this, this paperwork technique, they can get a higher sales compliance rate than just by say, hey, blah, blah, this is our product, this is our product, would you like to make a decision? Yes or no? Yes? Okay, start filling out this paperwork afterwards. They actually get a higher compliance rate because of when you start filling out the paperwork beforehand because your brain has made a small amount of equipment and it likes to justify its previous actions. It's just an evolutionary flaw that our brains have. The next flaw that our brains have is that we we try to do and think what other people who seem like us do and think. So this is why laugh tracks work. Everyone knows what a laugh track is. You've all seen some some corny sitcom and the laugh track plays in the background. You just sometimes also laugh too. So laugh tracks are so effective that they even work when people 
who know about laugh tracks and know about this social proof flaw still fall for it. They still fall for it when they know it's being used. Um, there, have been, there have been a number of studies where they basically take a comedian and they have a control group where they play the comedian's stand up with no laugh track, no laughter, and they play the same comedian for the next trial with a laugh track over and everyone thinks in the second trial that the comedian is funnier. That's just how the social proof flaw works. Now the social proof flaw also goes the other way and it's the, it's the main reason for crowd theory. And it's the main reason if you're going to have a heart attack, do not have it in a group of people. People lie, act like the majority of the group. When something goes wrong, everyone's looking for what other people are doing. All at the same time. Which is why when you're being trained in incident response uh, and EMT stuff, not, not cyber incident response, is to, you're supposed to cut the ice, you're supposed to cut the anonymity, say, you call 911, you get me water, you get his feet. It cuts the ice and it breaks the problem of basically human mind and it trying to act and do like what other people are doing. So there's actually been a number of studies uh, where people would, uh, the test subjects would go up to people and they'd fake a seizure. So they'd go up and fake a seizure by a single person standing all alone. The single person would be like, oh my god, just, just go down and help them. Then they would do it to two people. It took longer, about 30 seconds before someone would actually try and help, on average. I can't imagine, because that's on average, that means like some, some two people probably took like five minutes to throw up all the statistics, and they're probably sitting there laughing, being complete assholes. So, and then you do it in a group, and basically no one will help unless someone has that training to basically say, hey, you call 911, you do this, you do that. And so it's fascinating. So this is also how riots work, because people on their own usually do not go about protesting by themselves, um, unless you're a Tibetan monk. Um, and they also usually do not go off you know, vandalizing things and burning cop cars by themselves and obviously trying to flip cars by themselves. So, so the next flaw that the human mind falls for is essentially we tend to cooperate with someone who seems to like us. And this is how, why good cop, bad cop works. And it works so well. It's also, and I don't even need to explain that, it also is exploited by salesmen. After a salesman makes a deal, closes a deal, they, he or she usually asks the customer, do you have any friends that uh, you could recommend that would be interested in this market? And if they say yes and they give a number, they'll be like, hey, and I'll give you, I'll give you uh, $50 gift card if I make a sale or give you some sort of incentive to provide that information. And the reason they, 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 they give money and they give incentive to uh, disclose that information is that the human mind when falls for this liking flaw. Because when you get a call saying, hey, I'd like to sell you this, as opposed to, hey, your friend Bob called, told me I should call you and tell you about this great deal. You're actually more likely to comply with someone saying, hey, your friend said this and that. <clears throat> so this is also uh, studies, studies on this flaw have delved into basically exploring how lame your flattery can be in order to be effective. Um, and it actually shows that the more it's, there's some sort of like strange inverse bell curve where Really accurate, good flattery is pretty effective. Crappy flattery is not so effective. And then absurd flattery becomes more and more effective. It does not make any sense for how the human mind works. Um, like if, if I were to say, you have really nice, long, flowing hair. I mean, I just made you smile. It's kind of funny. It's actually, it's totally absurd, but it's a little more flattering than your hair looks kind of OK today. <laughs> so the brain interprets the very attempt at flattery as flattering itself. And if you can get to the person laugh at the same time by being absurd, it's actually more effective than being crappy and flattery yourself. The next thing the brain falls for is that we tend to cooperate with someone who seems to be in charge. 
And this is so well exploited by advertisements. We've all seen an advertisement say like, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. Right away, he tells you, you shouldn't trust me. So I think, I'm not sure, some coffee company, I think it's Maxwell House, uh, did this. And it sold more coffee than any other, sold more of their product than any other company's advertisement for all time. And so this is basically the case study taught in all marketing uh, d degree programs. And no one's been able to beat it to date. So um, there's also a problem that uh, this flaw often causes people to follow orders too closely or too literally. So in the realm of social engineering for the purpose of penetration testing, perhaps there's a small little nuance in the terminology for their policies. Um, you might be able to exploit that nuance by either impersonating someone who has authority or by citing someone falsely that has authority saying that you need to make this happen because of this wording. So maybe you need to let me in the server room or something like that. Um, Yes. Could you be like, hey, this is the chief security officer at X company, and I'm just calling to make sure you were compliant on this business. So yeah, in the case of an upcoming merger, that would work perfectly. You already established yourself as someone who seems like they have authority. Uh, so simply just establishing yourself as having some sort of seemingly authority makes you that more trustworthy inside the human brain. Um, so this is why lab coats. When people wear them in a commercial, look like it's more like looks like it's legit as opposed to a bunch of people trying to sell you a pharmaceutical drug in a lab and they're surrounded by test tubes and beakers and just wearing jeans and stuff. You know, well, they obviously don't look like they know what they're doing. So just by looking like you know what you're doing and looking like you belong and looking like you might seem like you're in charge, you get a higher compliance rating, uh, basically rate with generic questions than not. The last one, uh, I believe, the human brain, human brain really does fall for very well is the notion of scarcity and that we tend to overvalue apparently scarce seeming resources. This is why holiday and Christmas toy crazes happen. Oh my god, they're all sold out, they're all sold out, they're all sold out, I have to buy it now because it's worthless after Christmas. Um, this is why limited time offers work so well. And so there have been experiments with cookies and jars. And every single time this, cook, this experiment is replicated with normal people, it gets the same results. They take the same batch of cookies in two jars and they put, a, they put like 50 cookies in one jar and 20 cookies in the other. And they go to like a supermarket or someplace and they say, hey, we're doing a taste test sample for our company. You're allowed to try one cookie. Uh, no, you're allowed to try a cookie from both jars, um, but you have, to fo you have to form up in line. And so the line for the shorter jar is always longer, and when they try the two, they always say that the jar, the cookie from the smaller jar, always tasted better. And it's the same damn cookie. It's just the brain makes it seem that much better. And so in other aspects of the world, uh, Censorship is actually information scarcity. If you see knowledge that has been censored, your brain values it more. It could be something that's completely false, like aliens were responsible for the moon landing. And if I were to censor that, even if it's completely false, and people were to discover it, and discover the fact that I censored it, they would value it greater. So this can be used for counterintelligence purposes quite effectively. So this also, backfires in courtrooms. When a jury is asked to ignore or dismiss valid evidence, when they go back to make deliberation, most of the people in the room can't stop thinking about why did they dismiss it? And stop, can't stop focusing on that. And there have actually been studies just on mock trials with legit juries that were called in for jury duty, just basically science funded by the judicial system to show that actually this backfires more often and it always influences their decision. So um, the, the scarcity flaw of the human brain 
can be exploited to gain access. For instance, if you're uh, if you're doing a on-site uh, penetration test, so you could say, "I'm only here until noon, so if you don't authorize me to fix your problem, you have to wait till next month for me to return." Good luck explaining that to your boss um, and putting the pressure on them. And uh, exploiting scarcity is a great tactic for getting a raise. Um, you can say something like, you know, Google has been asking me to interview with them, just so you know. So in reality, these are just tricks that statistically increase the odds of compliance. And they're obviously not going to work every time. Who's played Daisy? One, two people know what I'm talking about. Anyone who's played Daisy seriously knows that it's perhaps one of the greatest psychology experiments or should be psychology experiments in the world because it's basically you start off you have nothing and there's zombies everywhere and they're insane and it's a fight for your life and so when you meet someone else that's also in that fight for your life the psychology of how you cooperate is so influenced by who gets a gun first it's ridiculous <laughs> And so people will often yell at like the top of the building, hey, I'm friendly, I have supplies, and unwitting survivors will come in and sneak into the building, evading all the zombies, and then all you hear is a gunshot. <laughs> I can't count the number of times that's happened. That's, it's, it's such a funny game. So this stuff won't always work. Um, the ma the, because magic word isn't going to work 100% of the time, you can't just say, I need to fix stuff, so let me in the server room because I need to fix stuff. I mean, it may actually work. If you ever do that in your life and it works, I'll buy you a beer. That would be so awesome. Um, so it's also definitely not going to work if you say something, remember how you gave me a raise last week? Well, it's about that time again to try and exploit the consistency flaw in the human brain. It's definitely not going to work. So... In reality, however, social engineering is usually the easiest way to get into a system to gain access to a network. Um, and if you if you see the vast majority of breach reports and uh, penetration uh, reports, you'll see that there's some aspect of spear phishing or uh, social engineering that was exploited somewhere in that attack chain and actually worked quite well and exposed way more information or access than it should have. Um, and this is why post-exploitation spear phishing works so well. Hey, I'm the CEO. Could you give me the, my email and password, my username and password to the system? I completely forgot. I've been drinking too much, you know, over in Vegas or something. Yeah. So how can you defend yourself or a company that you work for in the future against this stuff? It's really hard. The best you can do is raise awareness of these principles, of these evolutionary triggers that can be exploited. Um, and the best way you can protect yourself is practice by resisting advertisements. Say you see some delicious food on TV and you find yourself in the drive-thru line, steer out of it. Practice resisting or something like that. Um, and also practice by using these flaws on your friends. And especially try to practice on this spring break. Because it's the perfect break and time to do it. Maybe you'll get a free drink or something if you're old enough. So um, the, the topics talked about today were from the book, The Psychology of Persuasion, and a lot of my presentation was influenced by uh, a brilliant scientist I met at Sandia, Philip Kegelmeyer, and he gave a presentation two times when I was there just over the summer, and he gives this presentation several times a year. It's a wonderful presentation, um, and you can view uh, the video for it at this link. And so um, there are actually technical toolkits to augment your social engineering uh, tactics. Um, Socialengineer.org is related to the Metasploit Offensive Security Project. And then they specifically focus on uh, providing technical tools to augment uh, social engineering. So for instance, uh, phishing uh, scams, like getting you to access, go to this website and enter your log information, there are basically phishing uh, uh, social engineering tools if you take a website, scrape it, clone it, and produce a working replica that can uh, fish passwords and stuff, as well as taking company like uh, 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 headers and uh, papers and cloning them and basically email to make it look legit as well. Um, 
So there are actually a surprising number of tools that can do this sort of stuff, and that are actually quite effective. So that is the end of the lecture for the day. And if you haven't turned in homework five, do it now or email to me as soon as possible. Um, and have a safe and happy spring break.